Hello everyone, my name is Nevin Akaydin and I am a librarian at Santa Clara City Library and we have a very special guest tonight, Dr. Patrick Hunt and he is he has been teaching at Stanford University for years and he is a writer of 22 books, two of them are bestsellers and number 23 is coming in November and also he is a traveler of course uh, and also his articles are published and have been published in, um, in uh, National Geographic uh, magazines and other publications. So I am glad that he has time for the Santa Clara City Library and he can share his knowledge with us. And I am sure a great talk waiting for us. Thank you, Patrick, for being um, really generous about sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Nevin, it's a pleasure to be on. And uh, as, as far as history shows, uh, libraries and librarians are the gatekeepers of civilization. So here's, here's to you, that, as a gatekeeper of civilization. Yeah. Uh, I raise a glass to you, Nevin. So oh, thank you. I raise up my water. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> So, um, shall we start? Sure. Okay, please share your screen and I'll turn off my camera. And hi, Pam, by the way. <laughs> uh, Pam is uh, Patrick's wife. So we, uh, we organized this talk with uh, both of them. So thank you for joining us tonight also. Uh, yeah, I'll turn off my camera and stage is yours. Okay. Let's see here. Hmm, the, the, the screen share is not quite there. On the bottom of your screen, um, you will see, uh, yeah, here you go. Okay, there it is. Yes. Excellent, all right. Well, uh, as Nevin said, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to learn uh, distance learning and uh, I, uh, know that because we don't have to worry about driving or parking, we can imbibe. So I raise a glass to Nevin and to all of you, <laughs> wherever you are. Uh, and I know we have a distinguished audience. I even see a uh, uh, someone with the Order of Canada who's on uh, board tonight, uh, Sue Hammond, who if you know the Classical Kids series, uh, she's the writer, producer, director of that. So for coming from Canada, we have a lot of people all over the world. And this is, uh, for me, a great pleasure to be able to share something that I love, and that is uh, history, and specifically history of wine. Uh, as Nevin said, uh, I'm an archaeologist, and I split my time between uh, National Geographic and Stanford. And uh, in the past 40 years, wherever I've been working as an archaeologist, I find that we archaeologists tend to uh, want to uh, explore uh, the viticulture as well locally. I've never met an archaeologist who didn't enjoy wine. So, uh, uh, for example, when we lived in the top of the Grand Saint Bernard Pass and in the monastery there, I would land in Paris, uh, rent a car at the Paris uh, Charles de Gaulle, uh, and then uh, drive through Burgundy and stop by and pick up some uh, bottles of Grand Cru for the abbot and the prior of the monastery. So uh, those developed in some wonderful relationships, both, both monastically. Uh, remember the, the rule of St. Benedict is that you read your Bible every day and you have wine every day. So it sounds pretty good to me, especially uh, knowing that uh, uh, these monks were very sophisticated. And... Uh, tonight, we're going to mostly look at the early material, so starting thousands of years ago. How many thousand? I guess we'll start with the Paleolithic, the Old Stone Age, and even then we can't put a, a cap on that. Uh, we'll have to maybe even assume a million years. Uh, but industrial wine, that is commercial wines and wineries have been around for at least 6,000 years, so Neolithic, and we'll go through that period and then move up into the Greeks, who owed a lot to their Anatolian, that would be Turkish uh, cousins, 
And then, of course, uh, we'll just touch on Rome and a bit on France. Now, uh, just a word of warning, uh, a little caveat. Uh, this is a course that I've taught at Stanford many times. Also, I've taught uh, pretty much the same lecture for the San Francisco Wine School and the Institute of Masters of Wine, although it really is different every time. And it, it, when it's a course, it's a 20-hour course. So I'm really trying to compress uh, a lot of history and a lot of material into one hour. It, 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 you, you be the judge if it's successful or not by the end. But let's jump right in, shall we? And uh, uh, you see in the background uh, of the image, uh, you can see the god, the Greek god Dionysus, which means the god of Mount Nysa. N Mount Nysa was in Phrygia, that's Anatolia, that's Turkey. So wine came to the Greeks from Turkey. Uh, and that was pretty close to the, the heart and origin of the sources of wine production. So there's the god Dionysus. We'll look at him again later. Uh, but uh, you also might see in the background behind me my uh, little bit of wine library. Uh, notice they're all upright, so these are empties. But I'm a sentimentalist, so I keep my collectibles as well. Uh, now, here, uh, just uh, I, I, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm advertising a little book called Wine Journeys. Um, it's a, a bit of a memoirish belle lettre book on wine history, but much of the material from tonight's lecture will parallel this book. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, when I teach uh, on the history of wine for whatever entity, uh, it's a lot of fun to be able to share wine because history connects in so many points uh, to wine. Civilization connects, uh, the arts connect, so many of the arts uh, possibly even came about uh, dance and uh, poetry, came about from the possible elevated states of wine conviviality. That's actually been pretty well proven, but we won't stay there too long. Now notice, if we go all the way back to uh, deep, uh, what we call hominid or uh, paleoanthropology or uh, what we can ever call our human uh, uh, ancestors, uh, one of the titles I actually have for the Institute of Ethnomedicine is Archaeoethnobotany. So I study the history of plant use. And here you can see in the image uh, what looks like a fairly uh, uh, wary guy. Uh, and, and it's very possible that our human ancestors watched the animals first. Uh, and they watched, for example, birds eating pyracantha berries uh, and then uh, wobbling around in flight. And if you know, there's a famous BBC documentary. It's, it's, you could say uh, about animals uh, who uh, have a real penchant for fermented fruit. And uh, you can see that we were not the first to discover alcoholic beverages. Uh, all kinds of animals have beat us to it. Uh, elephants, uh, squirrels, chipmunks, and of course, notice that poor moose elk in Sweden stuck in the tree because he was trying to get to the cider in those apples and he couldn't get down. I wonder how many he had. Well, animals and alcohol, been around a long time. Now, uh, according to my dear friend Fritz Maytag, uh, you may know Fritz, uh, York Creek Wines, uh, Ankerstein Brewery, uh, uh, a tremendous uh, gentleman. Uh, uh, and uh, Fritz and I were talking at one point about how the, sh the grape is the perfect sugar package for fermentation. In fact, the Greek word for glucose, sweet, uh, gives us that, that what we call glucose. And wild grapes exist all over the world, not like our huge, glabrous, bursting, big grapes that we have today, but wild grapes are everywhere. Vetus vinifera grows all over, and there are others too. Uh, Vetus sylvestris, just about every continent has wild grapes but we have been hybridizing them. And the question might remain, how did we get to the grape uh, as, as a grape, as a wine, as an alcohol package? Um, hmm. Uh, you all know the biological terms, commensality and symbiosis. There you can see the plover who's cleaning the teeth of the crocodile. That's commensalism. A little dangerous, but there you have it. And Look at how many uh, life forms coexist in need of each other. Uh, our honeybees and pollination. Uh, these relationships are such that 
uh, we can ask who domesticated what and whom and when. Uh, we know, for example, the first domesticated animal may have been the dog, and I put this cartoon up, look at that. Forget the expert, domestication of dogs took only about eight seconds, and you can see the thought of the dog. Cooked meat, wheels to chase, a fire to bask by, fellas, we're done evolving. Well, uh, you may know that, that uh, there are lots of stories about uh, dogs and humans uh, coexisting and in graveyards and cemeteries going back thousands of years, the dog was there. But the wolf was, was really the, the, the first domesticated dog. And I guess the wolves uh, decided that uh, our food tasted better than we did. Uh, so uh, there's the domestication of animals, but the question is who domesticated whom? Um, plant and human relationships, you probably know that there are a lot of books about this, that plants may have decided that we could help their evolution and their distribution, their dispersion, if they produce something that we would like uh, and then would help them with by sharing. And that may tr be true of coffee arabica and of, uh, of chocolate, theobroma cacao. These are two pictures from Kauai. One is from the Princeville Botanical Gardens where I spent some time. What if these plants evolved to produce something that we wanted and that they, they knew we would want and the fermentation process may have uh, probably helped that along. Uh, so uh, it's very possible uh, that this theory, uh, this hypothesis uh, is a true one, a valid one. We know plants have sentience and I don't wanna go out, way out into metaphysics here, but uh, you can look at all the experiments with plants and uh, uh, sensibility, sense, intelligence, and so on. So maybe the grape developed uh, to serve us, and then we would serve it by helping it spread. Hmm, it's an idea. Now let's go uh, all the way to uh, the Near East. Let's go to Iran. I've spent uh, some fair bit of time there in Iran uh, as a guest in cultural diplomacy. And if we go far up to the north, up here to Lake Ermia, uh, you've got the Zagros Mountains and the Caucasus Mountains, and this was actually the, the homeland heartland of wine production between Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Armenia, Georgia, and, and those areas. And we'll come back to that, but here's a blow up. This site called uh, Tep Haji Firuz, or uh, it was where uh, friends of ours have been doing the, uh, the chemistry on wine, looking at the actual chemical traces with liquid and gas chromatography to see what's, what's in the shellac on these vessels. And here, Dr. Mary Voigt uh, and uh, uh, Patrick McGovern, Dr. McGovern, who's a chemist, he's the uh, world's Eno archeologist. They found these, these uh, uh, different jars, six of them in fact, identical in size. And inside them, they had this pigment shellac and the chemical traces show they had a terebinth tree resin uh, to preserve the wine. And they found uh, calcium salts from tartaric acid. Uh, and they found malvidine, which is a red pigment found in red grapes. And those are pretty much absolute givens that this was a wine production site. So 5400 BCE, that means that 7400 years ago that wine production in the Neolithic was going on uh, uh, commercially at a pretty big uh, rate. And when you go to, for example, here's a picture I took in the National Archaeology Museum of Tehran in Iran, and you can see these fine, fine ceramic vessels that were probably uh, wine vessels. And you can see this is fifth millennium uh, BC. So uh, uh, that means 7,000, uh, uh, six, 7,000 years ago. Uh, and here's another one that I took in the Louvre pretty much the same identical vessel. They're not the same vessels. You can look at the, the zones and you can see different things, but uh, these are probably wine cups and a wine vessel for socializing. Uh, uh, from Susa in Iran, a site that itself goes back to 6,000 BCE. So seven, 8,000 years of culture there. Now, they wouldn't have been necessarily producing the wine there. Uh, it's very likely the Tigris Euphrates or other rivers uh, uh, and places around the Caspian, uh, the, the Kuran River and so on, were places of, of trade. And here, let's talk about a famous person. This is a relief uh, I found in Paris that now belongs to my good friend, uh, Irving Finkel, uh, who is one of the world's experts on 
on Noah's Ark. He's probably the expert, and this now is in his possession. But what do we, what do we know about Noah? Well, everybody uh, thinks about that Noah's Ark landed on Mount Ararat. Hmm. There's a photo I took of Mount Ararat flying over from Turkey, and it's a volcano, of course. You have a lot of volcanic uh, areas here, but when you actually look at the biblical passage in Genesis 8-4, for example, uh, here you can see the countries around it, Georgia, Armenia, Iran, and Turkey. Uh, so uh, all these, uh, these countries come together in the Caucasus and Zagros Mountains, where they interconnect. But the Bible in Genesis 8-4 does not say that Noah's Ark land on Mount Ararat. If you know your Hebrew, you'll know it says that the, the boat, the ark landed on the Hare, which is Hebrew plural, it's mountains of Urartu. And this was ancient Urartu in the time when the Bible was actually written down uh, in the Iron Age, from Bronze Age to Iron Age. So uh, 3,000 plus years ago, this area was called Urartu. So it's the mountains of Urartu uh, that Noah's Ark landed. Uh, so it could be anywhere between Armenia, Georgia, Iran, Turkey. And this is where the Epic of Gilgamesh says, in the same area, Mount Nisir, where the Ark landed. That's a little bit of a precipitous uh, pitch there. But uh, uh, Tablet 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh says that this is where uh, that Ark of Utnapishtim, who uh, after the flood that basically kind of destroyed the world, uh, he, gave, he got out and he began to uh, cultivate. And here's what Genesis 9 says, Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and so on. Now, this is the first uh, literal depiction of viticulture uh, in the Bible. And I just want to point out, he planted a vineyard. So his first agrarian task after the flood was to plant a vineyard, a lot of alluvium, a lot of uh, 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 you know, a lot of new fresh soil laid down. But notice what happened when he drank some of the wine, he became drunk. So clearly he was a pioneer uh, and there was not a tradition to explain to him uh, that uh, uh, he might have some uh, behavior as a result of drinking too much of this wine. Well, if you go to the doors of, of the Ghiberti doors of the baptistry in Florence, you can see Ghiberti's depiction of this with the volcano, uh, maybe Mount Ararat behind him, even though it's Urartu in mountains. Look at him, he's lying down under a, a, a Tuscan tun wine barrel here, and there are his sons. So Noah, from this region of Urartu, uh, the mountains of Urartu, uh, is where viticulture started according to the book of Genesis, which is no doubt an old text. Uh, you look at the Hebrew of that text, and there are fragments of, of what we call Ur Hebrew, really early Hebrew in that. But if you actually then explain where that is, very close to that. Now, you can see there's, there's Mount Ararat today, uh, and this was Urartu. So you've got um, uh, Armenia, Georgia, Turkey, Iraq, uh, Iran is, uh, sorry, Iran and Iraq is down below this, um, Azerbaijan. And uh, so all in this area right there is a little village called Areni. And here you can see the Arpa River. So let's, let's take a look. There is the Arpa River Gorge. And for scale, you're looking at some limestone cliffs. And notice there's some station wagons down there. Do you see the paved road in Armenia? There's some station wagons. And there's the cave with clearly archaeological blue plastic tarps. I'd recognize those from you know, anywhere. So you, you can see in this cave, the world's oldest winery was found. Now, 6,100 years BP means before the present. So this is a 6,000 year old winery. Now you saw some older wine vessels, but here's the oldest winery to date. And they had these big vats in it. Now, Dr. Gregory Aratian, sadly, he just died uh, a month ago. Uh, for, he was at UCLA and the University of, uh, in Armenia at Yerevan. And you can see these are big wine vats. And they were laid down at the bottom of this cave. Well, how do we know they're wine vats? It's a really good question. Uh, there's Greg next to them for scale. And in those vats, they found that same red pigment, malvadin, on potsherds. Plus, they found the, the tartaric salts, 
Uh, so these are givens that there was wine production, but just in case people weren't convinced, they found grape pips. Look at here, wine stems and grape seeds as well in some of those vessels. So the oldest winery in the world found today in that region between Armenia, Georgia, Turkey, Iran, and so on. So that's the homeland of where viticulture started uh, as a commercial enterprise. That means uh, that we now have the Neolithic uh, uh, sedentary peoples who are not just picking wild grapes. This is Vetus vinifera vinifera. This is the hybridized grape that's not a wild grape. So they knew what they were doing. They were planting and sticking around and harvesting them. Now today, uh, we have in the world right now, it may be changing with climate change, but we have this 30-50 zone in latitudes it's both the same in Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. And these are the best areas for wine production. Technically, uh, 50 is, you know, just under 50 is better. You don't really have much above 50. I don't think I've seen any viticulture above the 50 degrees latitude north. It, it's possible and it may be more possible soon. And really you don't have much below 30. Now, you know, in Egypt, we're, we're dealing with subtropical. Egypt did not start growing wine. They imported wine from the Levant, from what's today Phoenicia. Uh, and Turkey, you can see where it starts, this same area right in here. Uh, we're looking right there's the Caspian Sea. Uh, here's right here, the, the Zagros Mountains right there. The, the, uh, the, uh, uh, we've got the Caucasus Mountains and so on. Uh, 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 and the Elbrus Mountains. This is the heartland right here. This is where it started, uh, and between Georgia, Armenia, and so on. Now here, when you go to this site of Erla in Turkey, you can actually see in the foreground some red grapes. You can see in the fall, their grapes are turning red because of the pigments in them, uh, xanthophylls and cyanophylls and so on, and you can see the Chardonnays that turn yellow. So the grape leaves turn the same color uh, as what the grape uh, uh, juice uh, or the juice, uh, what, what the grape skin is going to look like. And Erla uh, has been making wine uh, clearly since the early uh, and before even the Bronze Age. So we're talking five to six thousand years of viticulture. When I visited uh, this uh, winery as a guest of the Turkish Ministry of Culture, we looked at the rows. There are rows that were cut into the ground here, terraces of this winery that were made well over 3,000 years ago. That's how long at least uh, they have even had terraces for growing wine in Erla. Uh, this is not too far from Izmir, ancient Smyrna. And there was a port called Klazomenai, and that's where the ships went out and brought their wine uh, to the west, including Greece. Now there I am with a big bottle uh, of Vurla. So that's one of the great products of this Erla winery. Uh, that's an oversized bottle for sure, uh, 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 bigger than uh, easily uh, a Jeroboam, sort of a Shalmaneser size. But anyway, now the wine was exported down the Tigris and Euphrates, down into Mesopotamia. So here we have an, uh, an emperor, uh, an, an Assyrian emperor, Ashurbanipal, sitting with his wife Semiramis under the vines. And what they did in countries that where it was too hot yet, desert countries, uh, um, we know that they grew the vines up trees for shade. Uh, Egypt had to do the same thing because it was too hot to actually grow the grapes uh, by themselves. So they needed some shade and eventually they were able to hybridize and cultivate grapes that would grow in, in their own regions. Uh, but first they had to import it. And here you can see, these are very, uh, these are fairly early Elamite cups. Also, these ones up there at the Louvre in Paris. The Persians were very fond of wine, Herodotus tells us. And on the famous Apadana relief at Persepolis, these are Armenians and Georgians bringing their wine to the emperors. Uh, they would have brought it to Cyrus and Darius and so on. Maybe you've been in Napa Valley to Dariush, uh, a famous Persian winery uh, named after the King Darius, Dariush in, in uh, Farsi. There they are, they're, they're recognizable by their garb, their hats, and they're bringing their small wine jars. Now Herodotus tells us that the Persians loved wine so much that when all the different satraps, the governors got together from the 120 provinces, and Esther chapter one in the Bible tells this story too, 
you could have a six month party. Uh, the wine really flowed. But Herodotus says that they all got together and they drank so much wine uh, that they became unstoppered, literally. And then in their councils full of wine, they made decrees. Can you imagine that? The kind of things you would make uh, having a lot of wine? What, you know, how, how, how free thinking you would be? Well, then the council met again some days later, completely stone cold sober. And they revisited all the decrees they made when they were full of wine, dare I say drunk. And they looked at those decrees, and if they liked some of them, they kept them. They figured that what they determined, full of wine and uh, totally sober, must be a good idea if they came to the same rational decision on both accounts. Isn't that clever? Well, Herodotus confirms that story. So the Persians fond of wine. Uh, there are a lot of wine vessels that you can find from Persia around the world, including at the Met. Uh, and notice, remember the czars of Russia when Georgia was part of their territory until recently, basically after 1990 or so, you could go to the czar's collection of Georgian wine, wines that would keep for over a hundred years, 200 years. Look at this. These are some wines, uh, auctions at Sotheby's and Christie's. I've been to some of these auctions where some of the wine bottles, just maybe 10 bottles would fetch a million dollar auction bid. They were so good. So I encourage you to try Turkish wine today. I encourage you to try Georgian wine. Uh, they're producing good wine today. The Tsar knew what he was doing. Now, Egypt, as I said, imported jars first from uh, the Levant, from Phoenicia, the site uh, called Abydos. It was pre-Phoenician Canaanite. So if you go to Egypt, you can see this. And this is a, an interesting story. When King Tut's tomb was opened up by Howard Carter in 1922, they found five wine jars the wine was dried inside them. And notice they yielded traces of red wine. Uh, King Tut uh, was a wine drinker and they had one wine that was the highest quality premium wine called Shada. And notice each one of these Egyptian wine amphora were labeled. The Egyptians had absolutely distinct wine jars. Uh, and notice the labels included what kind of wine it was, who the winemaker was, uh, the source of the vineyard and the year. All that was on the label. Sound familiar? So the Egyptians, uh, they kind of beat us to it. So Egypt was doing this. Uh, now, uh, if you know, I lived in, in Israel and uh, uh, occupied territories uh, for some time, Palestine, Israel, as a grad student in archaeology, and we would go to Mount Carmel. And there are some vineyards on Mount Carmel. And what you need to know that the name Carmel comes from two words, Kerem, which is the Hebrew word for vineyard, and El, which is God. So literally, Mount Carmel was God's vineyard. And there are fine wineries there today. Uh, now, you read chapter five of Isaiah, you'll see it talks about God's vineyard. There are over 200 references to wine in the Bible, and most of them are positive. Uh, you probably know Jesus drank wine and it wasn't grape juice. You know, uh, you, know you could only have grape juice uh, for a few weeks in the year. Uh, and you read about Jesus having wine, uh, even uh, serving his Eucharist, uh, uh, which would be April. That's, that's not going to be grape juice, uh, the Last Supper and so on. And when he made his famous uh, parable, you could read John uh, 15 and all that. And you know, I, I am the vine, he says. So anyway, uh, there's always been an elevating quality to wine. You just have to know your limits. Uh, now, uh, Thucydides, the great Greek historian, once the, once the people of Anatolia of Turkey shared that wine and the god of Mount Nysa, Dionysus, brought that wine over, notice what he says. The peoples of the Mediterranean region began to emerge from barbarism when they learned to cultivate the olive and the vine. Now, uh, in the background is a picture I took when I was at the American School of Classical Studies, Athens, uh, that was in Crete, by the way, this picture. And I was there as an archeology span grad student. And it's the site of the oldest wine press in basically 
uh, what, what we call modern Greece today. It's a 4,500 year old wine press from the Minoan times. Uh, and you can go right up and look at it. That's a picture I took in August. That's a picture I took uh, a different time in Greece in March. And you're looking at Mount Ida where Zeus was supposedly born in a cave there on Mount Ida. And you've got all these vineyards and you can see that they haven't leafed just yet. But here in Crete, this was the Minoan royalties villa with this wine press. And there it is. There's the building where the villa was. That was the view. Isn't that an incredible view uh, out across the, the valleys of Crete and Mount Ida? And here, if you go inside this building, there is the wine press. Uh, and you can see uh, exactly, uh, it's an absolute given that this was a wine press uh, from that Minoan period. Uh, and of course, we have uh, many, many evidences of viticulture coming first from Anatolia. Remember the myth of Europa and the bull, uh, a Minoan type figure of bull, uh, abducted Europa, who was the daughter of Queen Aginor from Tyre. And uh, he brought her across the sea to Crete. And then she gave birth to King Minos, the basically founder and myth of the Minoan dynasty. So we know that that, that that wine viticulture came from Anatolia and from Levant, the Near East. And then, of course, it also went to Greece, uh, kind of in that same process. There is a famous vase. I took that picture in Munich at the Antikin Salon. That's the boat of Dionysus. And he's coming across the sea from Turkey. He's crossing the Aegean from Phrygia. Remember, he's Dionysa, the god of Mount Nysa in Phrygia, Turkey. And pirates tried to abduct him. He turned them into dolphins and the mast into a big uh, vine uh, with clusters of grapes. And then the penance of the dolphins, the pirates from then on, was they had to lead ships into port. So here he comes to Greece, god, the god of Nysa, Dionysus. There's the image that you may have seen first. He's holding his wine cup, his kantharos. Uh, he has a panther skin around his shoulders because in Greek, the word panthera means pan all thera wild, the all right wild cat. Uh, it's a cat you can't tame. It's a god you can't tame. Look at the ivy leaves in his hair. That's a plant you can't tame either. Try controlling ivy. And they're holding his minads, the sacred women next to him. They're holding his fennel rod, which he touches dead wood and it blossoms again. And notice also uh, there's a snake on the arm of this lady uh, and it's a bearded snake. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's mimicking, channeling the god Dionysus. So this is a women's uh, ritual, uh, a, a sacred mystery of Dionysus. The Greeks made it very famous. And if you read Euripides' play, The Bacchae, you'll see what happens if you uh, ignore this god or try to stomp him out. Poor Pentheus, uh, read the play, you'll see what happens to him. Very sad story. He tried to stop the god of wine. Now, uh, in these wine amphora, and you saw the picture of the wine amphora, uh, here are a lot of different Greek pottery vessels. These are the, these are the dominant pottery vessels we have from ancient Greece. Uh, and essentially you can see, you know, clearly more than 10 of them, 14 or so. Uh, and the, the calyx crater is a wine storage vessel. Here, let me hold one up for you so you can see it. Can you see the wine vessel? This is, this is a wine a volute uh, calyx, uh, same shape. Uh, and uh, this was a wine cooler. And these vessels that you're looking at, now notice that the, the first three are for transporting wine. You can see a couple that are water only, hydria, but then you've got a pitcher here that means wine pitcher, oinokoi. The word, the Greek word oinos for wine comes from Mycenaean linear B, late Bronze Age, but it actually comes from Phrygian. Uh, it comes from the Hittites of ancient Turkey, the word wine. That's an old Hittite word. Now, look at all these vessels. Uh, cups, these are here some cups. Uh, for wine. And of these 14 major vessels, and by the way, we find these in Greek tombs, Etruscan tombs too. We've got all these from tombs. Why? Well, the Greeks believed in this world, you can only drink so much wine. And if you drank too much wine, well, you kind of lost control. But they believed that when you die and you go to the afterlife, you can drink as much wine as you want, and you'll just get 
well, higher and higher and higher because you don't have the limitations of mortality. Nice idea, isn't it? So with that, how many vessels in Greek tombs are wine related then? What would you expect? Boom. You know, 64% uh, uh, of them are wine. All the major Greek vessels that we have are wine related, except for the water pitcher and a few uh, ointments. These here are funerary ointments. So wine was important to the Greeks, that's for sure. Now you can see here, uh, the yellow images are uh, some of the Phoenician uh, wine vessels that spread all over the Mediterranean. The Phoenicians brought wine first to Etruria. When you go to, uh, to Sicily and to Tuscany, the oldest wine vessels there are actually from Tyre, from Phoenicia. And it's maybe even possible that the Sangiovese grape itself comes from old Phoenician clones. That's, that's still being studied as I speak. Uh, but look at all these red labels are where the Greeks spread their wine. They even got outside to the Atlantic. Corinthian wine went way out uh, into Mauritania, here up in the Crimea, uh, and so on. Uh, the Celts, uh, Gauls, loved Greek wine. They imported it and they drank it straight. So the city of Marseille, which was ancient Massilia, it was founded to export wine to the Celts, to the Gauls of France. Uh, one French pr princess, a Celtic princess, a Gaulish princess, died with the biggest crater, crater we've ever seen, five and a half feet wide. She was buried with it so she could have a party in the afterlife. So these uh, up the Rhone River, these, these Celts, Gauls, they loved Greek wine. Interesting, they drank it straight up. They didn't mix it with water uh, like the Greeks usually did. But anyway, this wine got everywhere. And if you look off the Mediterranean, there are thousands upon thousands of these Greek uh, and Roman wine vessels from shipwrecks. Here you can see 300,000 liter, uh, this one off Marseille, one shipwreck with almost 100,000 amphora. That's a lot of wine. Uh, and it was, you know, as far as we can say, destined for this Gaulish market. So the city of Marseille started as a wine export center from, from the, the Greeks. Now you know your Homer, where he talks about the wine dark sea, uh, uh, meaning wine, uinos, and op sea, uh, what you, that's sight. So that's wine dark sea, uh, and that's in Homer and the Iliad, uh, the wine dark sea, because it turns a beautiful purple. Uh, both uh, at sunset and then when the sun comes up in the morning, that wine dark sea. And of course, wine figures in these epics. Now you all know, by the way, that uh, Odysseus's father, King Laertes of Ithaca, he retired to be a wine grower and winemaker uh, when he left the kingship of Ithaca. Uh, and uh, we're told uh, all about his vineyard in the Odyssey. Now here's Dionysus. Uh, who looks like he's kind of in his cups, and he's bringing wine to Greece. He's followed by satyrs, and there's his staff with the fennel, and he's bringing this to a man called Ikarios. So he's showing the Greeks how to grow wine. And he sh already showed the Minoans, and so now he's showing the Greeks. You saw him come across in his boat. Well, that place is well known. When I was a grad student at the American school, I went to the site of Ikaria. Now you can't tell from here, but I had to climb through a forest of brambles to get to it. It was kind of abandoned. Uh, and there's the site of Ikaria, right there. Well, in 1984, I found it. I used my maps. I'd walked all the way, kind of a reverse marathon. And when I sat down there, I pulled out my little flute my wooden flute, and I started playing sort of some happy Greek modal music. And I'd not been playing for more than five minutes on my wooden flute, when all of a sudden a Greek girl, girl came to the fence there. You can't quite see the fence, but there's a vineyard right here, which makes sense. This is the site of Ikaria. So you'd expect a vineyard. And by the way, the town today is called Dionysos, after Dionysus. So she called out to me, Yasu, 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 and I went over and she said, who are you? What are you doing here? Uh, and I said, Americanike, I was American. And my, my uh, uh, Greek and her English, it was, we, we had enough to communicate with. Uh, and 
I look at the vines and the vine stalks here, clearly pre -flux, the vine stalks were as big as my thighs. And I said, wow, these must really be old vines. And she said to me, yes, these vines were planted by Dionysus himself. <laughs> the Greeks believe their mythology. Well, I ended up staying with her and her family for several days. Great xenophilia, great Greek hospitality. They were impressed that an American could find this remote site and, and uh, that I knew some of the mythology. Uh, so uh, that was a fun time at the American School of Cosmic Science as a grad student, discovering the place where Dionysus brought the Greeks to Greece. Now, there are these great stories about Greek wine customs. Now, the Greeks had a plan that you could have, basically, uh, you look at the cups, and the first cup of wine, there's a, a cup there, a skiphos on the sides, uh, and there's the god Dionysus in the middle there of this, uh, this marble sarcophagus. Uh, and the first cup was for breaking the social ice. The first cup was for conversation, for exchange, what we call phrases, our word phrase, uh, a spoken phrase comes from this, from speaking. So the first cup was to basically make people at ease for conversation. And uh, they may have mixed the cup with water, but uh, it was a pretty big cup too. Could have, hold, could have held a quart, but mixed with some water. Uh, the smaller cups could be straight. But if the first cup was for conversation, and if you went on to a second cup, the second cup, interestingly enough, was for philosophy. Love of wisdom, philosophia. Now, isn't that remarkable? Uh, uh, haven't you ever felt at your second cup, you're wiser and more brilliant and more profound? Hmm, maybe not, but the second cup for philosophy, uh, for thinking. Uh, and it's well established that Plato's symposium about the conversation of Socrates and friends there in Athens, it was called the symposium, which was when people get together to drink wine and they're philosophers. So maybe they went past the second cup. I don't know. Maybe they beckoned for, you know, uh, uh, some accompaniment. If they went to the third cup, this is when inhibitions break down. The Greeks said the third cup was for love, eros. Hmm, well, uh, you know, most people would know when to stop, right? You'd hope people would know uh, limits. First cup, conversation, the social ice breaking, the second cup, philosophy, the third cup for love, with inhibitions lowered. Those are the three good cups. And you probably shouldn't go beyond. But if you did, well, the fourth cup, uh, obviously, uh, they knew exactly the quantity where this transitions. The fourth cup was for machia, fighting. The guys would start getting punch drunk and they would start fighting if they went past the third cup. They should have left it alone at the third cup. Anyway, fourth cup for fighting. And if they went beyond to the fifth cup, even worse. Mania, madness, delirium. It's a lot of wine. Now, interestingly, there is a sixth cup. What does it do to you? Sleep, <coughs> hypnos. So that's the Greek levels of the, the six cups, and you should know where to stop. Now, uh, I have one, I don't quite have a cup. Here's to you. I have my little uh, bit of wine here uh, in a ballon. Uh, mm, it's really good, but I'm not going to have more than that. Uh, and it's got some resveratrol in it, uh, and that's good for longevity. Plus, it's got uh, uh, in it the flavonoids and the, the esters of wine, red wine in particular. Uh, they even uh, dissolve plaque in the bloodstream, but that's one cup. Beyond that, mm, I'm not so sure it's going to be uh, any better. It may just, you know, be too much. But moving from the Greeks, uh, let's look very quickly at the Romans. The Romans learned their winemaking from their Etruscan older cousins who got their first grapes from the Phoenicians. And look at wherever the Roman legions went when they conquered Europe, they brought wine with them and they adjusted the grapes and the winemaking to the climate. So first, of course, the first part 
of uh, what was called uh, Provincia, Provence today. That was their first foray along the Rhone River. And then they went up the Rhodanus, Rhone. That was their next area of viticulture. But they also met with the people of the, the tribe of the Aquai, what we would today, they would call themselves the Aquitan, or we would know them from the Celtic name, Occitan, or Paidoc, the people of Oc. So they had a, a town called Berdigala, which is the city of Bordeaux today. Uh, so they were there uh, planting grapes, some of the Carmenet first grapes uh, of the Cabernet family. Uh, and of course they went up the Rhine River as well, what was called the Rhenus, so Alsace. There are wine cellars from the, the Romans there too. And this is mostly a white grape area. And then of course they also had the area of what was called Campania Gallia. We know that name today, Campania, the countryside of Champagne. It's the same word. So the Romans and their legions brought viticulture to France, first to the Gauls and Celts, and then they start growing it themselves when those legions, wherever they went, the legions brought grapes because wine was part of the ration of the Roman soldier. Now, you know, Pliny the Elder wrote a book called The History uh, of Nature, Natu Historia Naturalis. And Pliny says an interesting thing. He says that you can take the soil on one side of a hill and the soil is different than on the other side and the sunshine is different than on the other side and the wind is different and the water is different where the water table is. So he calls this, he puts all this together, the, the soil, the water, the wind, the sun, and he calls it terra for earth. This is where the French word terroir came from. All those combinations are important. And uh, whether the French acknowledge always that Pliny is their source in his word terra or not is beside the point. It's an old idea that goes back a long time. Pliny, the Roman Latin word terra for what we call terroir today. How it can be different just an acre away. Now, uh, you may know that in that area where the Romans were, there's a village called Von Romane where the Romans were. Here's a famous hillside. In fact, up on a picture up above me there, there's the same a photo I took of this. Uh, it's in the village of Alos Corton. There it is in France. And that's the famous site of what we call Corton Charlemagne. And that vineyard you're looking at, Bonneau de Martre, has had four owners since 776. That's right. That's when Charlemagne gave that vineyard to the Abbey of Solieu. Uh, it's a famous wine. Uh, there's a bottle I had uh, in Norway. Uh, I found in the wine cellar uh, of a famous Kvicknes Hotel in Balestran. And I paid a a pretty decent price for that, Corton Charlemagne. There's the name of the wine from the vineyard that Charlemagne actually planted. There it is, do you see, Corton Charlemagne. Uh, it's one of the best wines in France today. In fact, it's the only village where you have Grand Cru Reds and Grand Cru Whites. So Charlemagne was a huge patron and sponsor of viticulture. We know from his biographers, especially Einhard, that Charlemagne, uh, he never uh, uh, drank too much wine, but he loved the product of viticulture. And so he started that in the, the Rhine River as well as in the Rhone River there in Burgundy today. So it's quite a story, isn't it? Now, we have to finish up. I'm so sorry to cut this short. Uh, you can imagine 20 hours of lectures. I'm trying to compress into one. And this is the Greek idea that when you drink the wine, when you drink the wine of Dionysus, you're drinking the God, God's blood. Uh, there's a very funny connection that um, a lot of Dionysiacs in the Roman world were confused with early Christians because they were drinking God's blood too. Uh, and interesting, the Greek word here is when you drink the wine, what happens? Well, you're in the God or the God is in you. You drink the wine, mm, you're partaking of the God's blood. So the God comes in you mm, mm, mm. and it may be psychotropic. The God, it may be mind bending that the God comes in you. 
Uh, you could lose control. This is a, a, a God you can't control, Dionysus. But what happens to you when you drink the God's blood and the God comes in you? Entheos is the root word for enthusiasmos. So if you have enthusiasm, it means you're full of the God of wine. Now, the first time I shared that with Robert Mondavi, he was tickled because it's very likely he was the best wine enthusiast in California. So this wine history, I uh, could, could probably go on way, way too long. Uh, and I've got to kind of cut it short, but I do want to show you a little bottle here. Uh, this is a, a bottle. Uh, you can see it's kind of a big one. Uh, I have a few Shalmanezers and Balthazars. I have some I can't even lift. They're so heavy, full of wine. I even have the tiny little splits too. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think wine really is uh, so connected to civilization. When you think of the first operas, the first ballets, when you go back to the Greeks and their harvest festivals and they would dance after they'd uh, harvested the grapes and uh, then they had crushed the grapes and then they drank the must and you could read the poets, whether it's Horace or Virgil or uh, Archilochus or any of the great Greek poets as well, uh, and Homer and Hesiod uh, as well, talking about the gifts of wine. As Thucydides said, the gift of wine was the basically beginning of civilization when people learned uh, to produce this. Now, Gaulish chieftains back 500 BCE, so 2,500 years ago, Gaulish Celtic chieftains could gather a, a clan around them by sharing that wine that they brought uh, from those Greek wine merchants. And that, that's basically uh, a well-established fact. Uh, you can read this in many publications, how wine uh, made social uh, interaction uh, better. Uh, uh, the, the icebreaker and the conviviality. And yes, you could go too far with it, but uh, there's no question uh, that uh, bards, poets, musicians uh, would uh, be able to uh, perform for uh, very welcoming audiences um, with the context of wine as a socializing, arts producing environment. So uh, I am well, uh, you know, here well, well aware that we could go 20, 30 hours beyond. I've left out 99% uh, of what I could share with you, but I know we have some Q&A possibilities. But I definitely will say to you uh, that, you know, uh, enthuse. We're going to enthuse together. So thank you. And thank you, Nevin, uh, for letting me share. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, and remember that uh, uh, it was uh, uh, a lot of this started uh, with Anatolia, ancient Turkey. So I'm going to stop the share now. And uh, we have some opportunities for questions. Uh, I'm assuming uh, that you can see here. Yes. Yes, thank you, Patrick. It was it was great, and also to see a lot of information about my home country, Turkey. Uh, and I can imagine how your course at Stanford would be really fun to listen to. Uh, we should have fun, especially in these days, right? Yes, yes. Thank you for a, a great talk. It was really. Uh, go ahead. It was really fun, Nevin. Thank you for making it possible. Yes, thank you. And um, yes, we have, uh, let's see. So you can also see the chat bar. Thank you so much for the amount of knowledge shared in such a, a short amount of time. Yes, definitely. Wonderful presentation. When is the next webinar? <laughs> Someone is asking. Oh, or, um, um, do you have any um, lectures coming up, Patrick, uh, other than this one? Not, not just course, but maybe a talk. 
Well, I have uh, my chair with the audience. Yeah, I have my Stanford class beginning tomorrow evening mm -hmm. on medieval art and archaeology. Uh, and then on uh, Thursday morning, I uh, am, uh, because I'm part of the Archaeological Institute of America, I have three lectures for the AIA, as it's called, Archaeological Institute of America. And the first one is on, well, it's a bit of a, I don't think it's a doomsday topic, but it's climate change, famine, and pandemic, and how they all come together, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's Thursday. Not so much fun as today's, I'm afraid. And then I'm giving other ones on Utsi the Iceman, which is one of my National Geographic projects. And then another one on the five new world plants that change world food, you know, potato, tomato, chocolate, avocado, and so on and so on and so on. So a lot of lectures that I give. Uh, and uh, this is so fun because as I saw from your screen, people from all over the world can participate in these. And Nevin, I mentioned before we start, I'm giving, I'm giving talks in the next month at the University of Munich, the University of London, Heidelberg, uh, and I get to do it, no travel expenses. No traveling. So, <laughs> so these are really fun. And this was so fun. Thank you for letting me share this with you. And I, uh, I appreciate your, uh, your generosity, really. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. My and, pleasure. And uh, if you can open your, uh, the Q&A bar, so you can read the question and then also answer it. Um, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you still see or are they in the way? Um, ah. I, can, I can read it, read them. Okay, I can um, see the question. Here's one. Uh, it's Victoria Gleason from Croatia. And she said her family made wine in Croatia before they came here. And yes, Croatian wine is famous. I've had a lot of Croatian wine uh, in uh, Dubrovnik and in Split and in other places. And, and it's very likely that Croatian wine is very similar to uh, one of them, our California Zinfandel, and what's often called Primitivo. Between uh, Croatia was ancient Illyria Pannonia and Dalmatia, and these were uh, provinces uh, first of the Greeks and then Romans and then the Venetians. So winemaking has been very, very important uh, in Croatia for thousands of years, much longer than in the US. And, and everybody knows who's the most famous Croatian winemaker in the United States? Mike Gergic of Gergic Hills. He teamed together with Austin Hills, but Mike Gergich made the wine, the Chardonnay that won the Judgment of Paris in 1976, a Croatian winemaker, the Gergich family. So yes, uh, uh, I'll raise a glass to Croatia. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Not and we have the a second question. Yeah, when did wine come to the Americas and how? Well, that's interesting. There were wild grapes here. Uh, in the U.S. and people tried to make wine. Um, the first wine merchants, uh, it's hard to say, uh, in the 17th century, uh, uh, definitely uh, remember that this country kind of started in the 1620s with Puritans, and they weren't probably so open to wine. Uh, but uh, very quickly the Dutch came uh, and helped. Uh, so uh, so I think some of my Dutch uh, ancestors in New York City, which was called New Amsterdam, may have been wine merchants there in Manhattan. Uh, and it's interesting. Uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who went and lived in France, as you know, during the part of the revolution, was a huge fan of Chateau Margaux and Chateau de Kim. And so uh, during, the, during the American Revolution, uh, some of these sophisticated Americans, some of our founding uh, persons, Benjamin Franklin, uh, uh, who went a lot to Café Procope, uh, and uh, Thomas Jefferson, and uh, they, they met uh, with winemakers and they helped stimulate the American wine trade. So 17th century, but definitely the 18th century, viticulture really takes off. And in California, uh, the Franciscan friars, started cultivating the local mission grape with other grapes and for sacramental wine, those missions along California from 1769 onward began wine production. 
And then, of course, the oldest winery in California was in downtown L.A., Don Alicio, right today where the Presidio is, uh, kind of under the Santa Monica Freeway today. But that was 1831. So, you know, Napa uh, was sort of a latecomer. Uh, Los Angeles first, Cucamonga, you know, the Franciscan missions, uh, eventually uh, Sonoma uh, uh, with Baron Harasti from, of course, Hungary. Uh, and then starting Buena Vista. And then, you know, Napa took off from Buena Vista's assistant, uh, Charles Krug, uh, and so on and so on and so on. So viticulture, one of the things that California certainly has not a monopoly on, uh, but a lot of sunlight, a lot of sunshine, and that helps the terroir or the terra. I would say uh, of the best Pinot Noirs in the United States today, probably coming out of the Willamette Valley, uh, uh, chapter 24 and some of those just fabulous uh, world-class wines, uh, Pinots especially. Pinot may be the best wine for your heart because the grape skins have antifungal plaque reducing properties better than any other grape and they have the resveratrol too. So you know you drink a glass of Pinot a day and you're probably going to live a long time. I spend a lot of time in Burgundy and it may sound macabre but I go to the cemeteries and I look at the age on the gravestones of all these winemakers. <laughs> they all live to their 80s and 90s, those Pinot, <laughs> those Pinot tours in France. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, another... Somebody, oh, uh, yeah, uh, Kumshiashvili. That's, do you know, that's a Georgian name when it ends Georgia. in... Georgia. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's a friend of mine from the University of Ottawa uh, uh, who teaches at Ottawa, and he and I do these wine ancient seminars together from, you know, the Georgian wine, which is still today. Uh, remember the Tsar's wine, the best, some of the, uh, you, you could easily say, uh, some of the best wine in the world. Well, thank you, Patrick. I think we answered all the questions. And um, if again, I am... Um, sharing the, the link with the audience. You can see it in the chat uh, box. If, please let us know what kind of programs you would like to see uh, at Santa Clara City Library so we can create um, related uh, programs with the community. So it, please let us know what kind of programs you would like to see. And thank you, Patrick, for tonight. And thank you all for attending and joining us. Um, thank you, Nevin. And you can share my email, you know, if people want to ask further questions, phunt at stanford.edu. Okay, I have the email list for, uh, the, from the registration, so I can email the attendees and giving your email address if they uh, have questions for you. Um, so have a good evening. I uh, hope to see you again next time. Thank Bye. you, Nevin. Enthuse. Enthuse. <laughs> I wish I had a wine glass, but not tonight. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.